We are going to get into our study and we begin with prayer. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, again, as we open up your word, we ask through your Holy Spirit to help us to rightly understand what you have revealed there. We come to you empty-handed, and apart from you, we cannot rightly understand your word. It is a closed book, so we ask through your Spirit that you open it to us so that we may believe correctly, but also do accordingly. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're doing our Ask a Pastor Sunday, which is something we've added into our uh, our Sunday school mix, and we're going to get right to it. If you want to have questions answered during the Ask a Pastor Sunday, then email them to secretary at kongsvingerchurch.org and know, know this then that the, uh, the, the questions go in order from the time we receive them, and anything that's not answered today will be held over until next, next month. So this is kind of an ongoing thing. So Cliff Warren, he asks, he says, can you please explain why Jesus switches from physical needs to the Holy Spirit in Luke 11, 9 through 13? It seems like he's saying to ask for your physical needs, but then ends with, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. So here's the text in question, Luke chapter 11, and we'll start at verse 9. Hang on a second here. Um, in fact, let me, let me just add some context. So we'll, we'll start at verse 5. Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. If you're my friend and you do this, you're no, my, no longer my friend. I just want to let you guys know that you do not get to do this at midnight. That is annoying. Okay. <laughs> For a friend... <laughs> For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him, and he will answer from within, Do not bother me. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will arise and give him whatever he needs. So you'll note that if you find yourself in this situation, just be annoying, and, and your annoyance will win. Okay, that's not the biblical principle at stake here, but... Christ is pointing something out, and the point that he's making is, is that God is not like that impudent friend, and you don't have to think of God as somebody who's not going to give you what you need. So he's not like any of us. That's kind of the point. God stands out as very different. So he, sa- he says, um, I tell you, then ask, and it will be given to you. Ask. Ask. It doesn't say decree and declare. It says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead give, instead of a fish, give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good, good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So you'll note, Cliff has pointed out correctly, it seems like oh, here we are heading down the track of bodily needs, and then all of a sudden Jesus slips this one in there and give you the Holy Spirit. Why did he switch? Because everything we need spiritually, physically comes from God. And so we are to ask God for our physical needs. We are to ask God for our spiritual needs. And you'll note that God is not going to not give you the Holy Spirit. And I would note here, do not think that the Holy Spirit is, the, is like that crazy uncle weird person that the, the charismatics believe in, okay? Uh, that's not the Holy Spirit, okay? The Holy Spirit who makes you quack like a duck, bark like a dog, and speak in gibberish, that ain't the Holy Spirit, that is an unhinged demonic spirit. It is not the Holy Spirit at all. So you'll note that the Holy Spirit, Christ tells us in the Gospel of John, the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin and unbelief. The Holy Spirit is, uh, is one that groans inwardly you know, on our behalf, praying for us when we don't even know what to pray for. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives us the strength to mortify our sinful flesh. And, uh, but the Holy Spirit is not going to make you quack like a duck and bark like a dog or anything like that. So the reason why Jesus talks about both physical and spiritual is because we need God for everything. Apart from God, you can do nothing. Nothing. So that's the point. Okay. Jacob asks a question. Does the, Ch- uh, does the Chattanooga, Tennessee portals seen in 2019 apply uh, something or connected to Bible prophecy concerning the last days. Now, if you're not familiar with the Chattanooga, Tennessee portals, the answer is no. It does has nothing to do with the last days, and I'll show you why. Uh, the reason why it has nothing to do with the last days. In fact, let me let me do this. If you want to know what they are, so there was a series of photos. 
and they're not from actually they're for, they're very recent uh, supposedly of these portals that appeared above one of the forests in the, in Chattanooga Tennessee here's the issue are you guys ready fake images of fire halos over Chattanooga go viral on social media they're fake AI, <laughs> AI strikes again okay okay yeah yeah, I think, I, I, you know what, I, I, it's not a biblical point, but I think it's a valid one, uh, <laughs> is, uh, is that, uh, you know, if God's going to give signs and wonders, Chattanooga, Tennessee ain't the place that's going to happen, okay, just, you know, Chattanooga has zero eschatological significance, just, let's just go there, so the issue is, is that the, the images themselves are fake, and when you see stuff like that, and people trying to make connections to eschatology, you generally are dealing with people who do not have a correct eschatology, okay? Now, it's true that there are signs and wonders that are going to take place, but if we take a look at what Jesus says in this regard, we know ex exactly what kind of signs and wonders we're looking for. Now, there are signs and wonders in the heavens also, but that's the sun, the moon, and the stars no longer giving their light and the stars falling from the sky. And I would note, nobody's going to sit there and go, I wonder if this has anything to do with the end of the world. Okay. <laughs> when the stars all disappear and the sun is, is darkened and the moon no longer gives its light, you can be assured assured. Oh, Jesus will be here in five minutes. Got it. Okay. Don't have to wait till the next ask a right, right. You don't have to wait till the next ask a pastor and nobody will be able to blame it on AI. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's just, yeah, right. So, so note that Jesus does talk about things that will, uh, so I'm in the wrong chapter, that the, the things that will happen at the end of the world. And we can look at the cross references too. Um, so note that uh, when Jesus is asked regarding what will be the sign of his coming in the end of the age in, in Matthew 24, he says, see that no one leads you astray. First thing to look for, are you ready? Deceivers. Okay, deceivers. And um, I, I am, I've been doing more in-depth research on the history of the Pentecostal movement. All right. So Charles Fox Parham, you guys familiar with this fellow? Charles Fox Parham. He's He's really considered like the father of the Pentecostal movement. And um, unbeknownst to a lot of people, the guy was a full-on racist, like legitimate racist. And, um, and his critique of the Azusa Street revival was that it was a mongrel revival because there were, there were Africans and, and whites all worshiping together and stuff. But there's another thing that a lot of people do not know about Charles Fox Parham, and I read a book that did some really good due diligence and uncovered all of this from, uh, from newspaper articles and from court records, Charles Fox Parham admitted in court when he was charged with sodomizing young boys that he had done it. He confessed that he did that. But his defense was this. He did it while he was asleep, and so it's like sleepwalking, so he can't be responsible for anything that he does while he's asleep. And that defense won. But note this, in court, he confessed to doing it. So I would note, a good tree does not bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Okay, when you look at the history of the charismatic and Pentecostal movements, it is one big, long parade of charlatans, grifters, hucksters, sexually immoral predators, and things like this, and the parade continues on to this day. There's a reason why that movement is not bearing any good fruit. I mean, I'm just saying, because it's a different Holy Spirit altogether, and the, the theology that they're believing in is legitimately, this isn't Christian theology, it's fantasy. I mean, it's just really bad fantasy. You, you, you believe you have control over the weather. Okay, okay. You, do, you believe that you can decree and declare and command, uh, and command cancer to do stuff. Right. Cancer doesn't even have any ears. Okay, you know, this, this is nonsense. Yeah, right. So note here, first thing, see, no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, and here's kind of the important, ego e mi ha Christos, let me give you a slightly different translation. I am an anointed one, okay? Or I am the anointed one. So the idea here is, is that 
Uh, you, you can say that the person is saying that I am the Christ, but you can also translate this as I am an anointed one. All right, now, so a Christos is an anointed one, and what do all these charismatic Pentecostals say that they are? Oh, they have the anointing and all this kind of stuff, and they do grave soaking in order to, to soak up the anointing from dead prophets and things like this. And yeah, and, and their apostles and all this. Yeah, touch not God's anointed. Yeah, a Holy Ghost machine gun to, to gun down all of his critics. Mm -hmm. I can feel the love of Jesus just dripping through that comment. Anyway, uh, so he says, you'll, see wars, you'll hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you are not alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, earthquakes, various places. All of these are about the beginning of birth pains. Then they will deliver you over to tribulation, put you to death. <clears throat> Why do a lot of people skip this part? Okay, you will be hated by how many nations? All, okay. So note that uh, what's coming is a zero tolerance policy globally for Christians, okay. Um, and then many will fall away, betray one another, hate one another. Many false prophets will arise. How many? Many, okay. Um, and I would note that the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry is a institution set up to graduate in it, you know, year after year after year, thousands of false prophets. That's what they exist to do. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold, the uh, one who endures to the end will be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So note then, here we have a, a few things to watch out for. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel, hint, hint, that's a, it's an homage to the Antichrist. Uh, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, let one who is on the housetop not go down, T take what, uh, what is in his house, let the one who is in the field not turn back, take his cloak, alas for women who are pregnant. Now you know, this is a proleptic prophecy here that has implications regarding 70 AD. Uh, with the arrival of the, the armies of Rome to destroy Jerusalem, but also has a f further fulfillment at the end of the world. So, by the way, what is the standard operating procedure given by Jesus that when the man of lawlessness appears, what are you supposed to do? Run. Run away. Okay? If you, you, know, if you want to survive, that's your only hope. Those of you who stick around, you will die. Okay? And so just note... And I might get to the point where I just say, I don't care. I'm just going to stick around and they can go ahead and kill me. It's like, you know, do your worst because it ain't going to do, it ain't going to be bad. So, so, right. So then there will be great tribulation such as not been from the beginning of the world until now and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. So then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ or here is an anointed one, right? Don't. Or, or there he is. Do not believe it. For false... Christ, false anointed ones, and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders. So it's it, this idea of like AI generated portals, <clears throat> um, you know, th that, that's not, those types of weather phenomena are not the things we're supposed to be looking for. And by the way, when you read the book of Revelation, you, we get a hint at to what these, these great signs and wonders, these false prophets and false anointed ones will be able to perform. And one of the ones that is noted in the scripture is the ability to call down fire from heaven. Okay? So note, as we get closer to the return of Christ, Satan completely being unbound, Satan will be the power behind those false signs and wonders and watch what their purpose is. False Christ and false prophets will, will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. The whole purpose of the false signs and wonders, or the great signs and wonders, or actual signs and wonders, is to mislead you, okay? So, you know, I am not a prophet, nor am I the son of a prophet, but I can see the trend. I can see the direction that this is all heading, okay? When these people arise, they will be able to perform undeniable, legitimate, true signs and wonders but they will not preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can always tell whether somebody's true or false based upon the message they bring, not whether or not they perform signs and wonders. So that being the case, um, you always got you always got to check the message, check what's being preached, and it will not check out. But here's what's going to happen: Michael Brown will sit there and go, "See you cessationists, 
You know, you, 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 the, the God is performing great signs and wonders through these people, and you sit there and go, they're not preaching Christ, and they're immoral, and they're false teachers and false prophets, and he'll say, I know them personally, how dare you judge them? How many books have you written? Have you written? Right, yeah, right, yeah. You, this is how this is going to go, okay? Yes? Yeah. So when they're performing the signs and miracles, they describe God's word, and you look it up and go, the stars are still there, the sun is still there. Right. Exactly. So the idea here is, is that what these people are saying is not going to jive with the word of God. And so anybody claiming to be Christ, claiming to be God in human flesh, that's kind of the ultimate deception. The Antichrist, a man of lawlessness, will claim and exalt himself above every God, claiming him, making himself to be God, within the temple of God, which is not a, a, a reference to the temple in Jerusalem, but the church, okay? He's a churchman, claiming himself to be God. So there's a bunch of people are going to sit there and go, that's Jesus, he's here. And you're going to look in there and go, well, there's still stars in the sky, and I can still see the sun. Um, no, that ain't Jesus. And Jesus warns ahead of time, don't believe it, right? So portals over Chattanooga, I mean, no, that's like, that, that's like the Virgin Mary appearing in Guadalupe. It's, it's, it's not real, okay? Yeah. Um, it, towards the end time, though, isn't there supposed to be two witnesses that are supposed to come down? So in the end times, there are two witnesses. The question is, are those two literal human beings or the two witnesses actually symbolic of something? And I would note that the, uh, the, the I think the more plausible understanding of the two witnesses is that that's... That's the that's the apostles and the prophets mentioned in the scripture, you know, and and them being killed is that, that is the world basically saying we don't have to listen to this anymore. We're going to outlaw Christianity altogether. I think that's a more feasible def, uh, uh, interpretation. Yeah. Well, see, watch what it says. So as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. So you got to remember that within the visible church, the, the, Satan has sown tares, wheat, uh, weeds among the wheat. And so the, the idea here is, is that the elect are not going to fall away. They're just not. They're, they're not going to fall for this deception. God's going to continue to sustain, sustain them. But here's the thing. How does God sustain the elect? Through his word. Okay, if you do not know God's word and you are listening to false teachers and false prophets and stuff like this, you are perfectly set up to be swept up in the crazy mania of the end days, believing the wrong things and putting your trust in the wrong characters, the bad characters rather than in Christ. So we are sustained then through the word of God, through the sacraments. So we are instructed by God in his word. We are not to listen to false prophets. We are not to listen to false teachers. We are not to listen to false apostles. We are to mark and avoid them and not participate in their sin. This is what we're told. But people sit there and go, well, you know, who are you to judge? And, you know, God, look at all the mighty things that God is doing through this person. They even have a million subscribers on YouTube. So who are you to say that they're wrong? That's not the sign as to whether or not somebody's a true person or not. You know, it doesn't matter if they have a bazillion followers on YouTube. The question is, what are they, what's the message they bring, and can it square with Scripture? That's the point. Yep. All right, next question then. Um, Jen Bennett says, if one does not show or exhibit contrition or sorrowfulness for their sin, but states, I am saved, and they say they are forgiven, do you need both parts of repentance to have genuine faith? I know faith is given by God, and I'm thinking a person like this would, not, would need a lot of law because the law accuses you, brings you to the knowledge of sin, sin uh, sinning against a holy God, which, would, which wouldn't that lead to sorrowfulness, contrition then? Also, if they have no contrition but tout I am saved, aren't they turning the gospel into a license to sin? Yeah, they are. So, so, for instance, if it, now I'm glad that Trump is finally telling the truth, but if you remember, uh, in Trump's first administration, he claimed to be a Christian, and his pastor is Paula White, and yet Trump said that he can't remember a single time in his life where he needed to repent of any sin. Should I believe that Donald Trump is a Christian? No, okay? Not at all, 
okay? Do I pray for his salvation? You bet I do, okay? But you're going to note that even after he's nearly been gunned down twice, he even recently made it clear that he's not a Christian. Faith does not come by bullets grazing your ear. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. Do you think that, that Donald Trump ever heard the real gospel from, his, from Pastrix Paula White? No, not at all. And so I will not believe that Donald Trump is a Christian until he says, you know what? I was wrong when I said that I've never, I, I, that I didn't re- need to repent of any sin. I was ignorant in saying such a thing. Repentance always is going to have two parts. True contrition and sorrow for sin, as well as confidence that God forgives you for the sake of Christ. The two come together, and without both, you don't have repentance. So you'll note Saul Uh, King Saul, he had no contrition, no sorrow, constantly blamed other people, and, and, and yet he wanted the pretense that he was forgiven and in a good standing with God. I would note the person who shows no contrition or sorrow for sin at all but claims that they're forgiven, I, my immediate question is, for what? What, what? what are you forgiven of exactly? And let's talk about the magnitude of what it is that you're supposedly forgiven of. Um, and Jen, you're right. That person needs law, okay? And so the idea here is, is that it, the proper distinction of law and gospel is played out in our conversations with neighbor. It kind of goes, goes this way, is that you cannot preach the gospel to anybody who doesn't recognize that they're a sinner. The only thing you can preach to them is the law. And only when they cry, uncle, Do you stop with the law and then you assure them that Christ has bled and died for their sins and you preach the gospel to them? And so when you were dealing with somebody who had like exhibited, exhibits like zero contrition, yeah, yeah, you know, Christ is forgiving me. Forgive me for what? You know, because I've, you know, I, I, you know, there's a few things. I've made a couple mistakes in life. A, a couple mistakes? Oh, that's impressive. <laughs> Right. So, yeah, no, Jen, you're on to also uh, also a topic I'd like to explore is on servanthood versus doormat. Like, where do we draw the line between serving others and not being a doormat? What does one do when people, co-workers, family, really anyone knows you're a Christian and they abuse, use or exploit you because they know you're going to do the things for them or extra work, etc., because you are a Christian. I would note that that line is a little more blurry than I would like, okay? So, for instance, Jesus says that when somebody demands that you walk with them a mile, which way they were coerced to do. Uh, so the, the Jews in Judea, when a Roman soldier said, hey, you, carry my kit, you were, the Roman law required you to carry it for one mile okay which is annoying because they got 15 minutes carrying this this soldier's kit you know of, of walking that mile and then you got to come back so it takes a whole half hour out of your life what jesus what does jesus say to do when somebody does that you don't go one mile you go two so he, here's the idea is that when you consider others better than yourselves you'll note that sometimes people have the intention of exploiting you, taking advantage of you, and basically saying, I know that they're not going to say no, so I'm going to do this. So here's kind of your choices in that situation. You, knowing that you're being taken advantage of, you absolutely have the freedom to be taken advantage of. But here's the thing, you can communicate it. You can sit there and go, I know that you're exploiting me because I'm a Christian, but here's the deal. I'm going to help you anyway because I'm a Christian, because I am called to consider others as better than myself, so I'm going to help you, despite the fact that your intention is just to exploit me and to do evil to me, so I'm going to let you. But you need to know and I, that I know exactly what you're doing, and I'm going to do it anyway, and so I'm going to do my good works in order to heap guilt on you, <laughs> right? Those are, those are the burning coals. We, we overcome evil by doing good. However, that doesn't mean that we as Christians don't have the freedom to lay down some boundaries when people are habitually constantly taking advantage of us because here's the thing. When they're doing that, when we do when we help them, we're actually enabling bad behavior. And so love for neighbors sometimes requires us to go, "No. 
I would be hurting you if I did that because you are a selfish, greedy, self-centered, manipulative, control freak, and I'm not going to give in to your nonsense because you need to repent of this, okay? Now, you may not want to say it that strongly, but the, the point is, is that you, you, the situation may require you to, in love, sit there and go, nope, I'm not going to help you. And here's the reason why, because by not helping you, I'm doing the best thing I can do for you. Sometimes the best thing you can do for a person is not give in to them and put a boundary up and say, you're not, you don't get to do this anymore. Okay. And sometimes the best thing to do is say, yep, I know you're exploiting me. And guess what? I don't care. I'm going to let you exploit me. I'm going to love you anyway and do it. Okay. But here's the thing. When do you do which one? I don't know. It depends. But here's the thing. Our good works are always done with our neighbor's best in mind, not our own, their best in mind. So you're going to have to evaluate what is the best thing I can do for my neighbor right now? Help them or say, no, you're going you're gonna to stop. You're gonna, you, you, this is sinful and wicked of you and you need to repent of this. Okay? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Right. Exactly. And so, so the idea here is, is that that requires you to make an assessment. How is my neighbor best helped in this situation? And when they come to you with an entitled mentality and they're spoiled little brats and they think the whole world revolves around them and they're taking advantage of you because you're a Christian, the best thing you can do to them is look them in their little demonic eyes and say, no, I love you and I'm not going to do this, right? And you need to repent of your demonic self-centeredness, right? You know, so again, that's not going to make you popular in the family, by the way, or among your coworkers, because they're going to say, well, that was harsh, that was unloving, that was unkind. No, it was the most loving thing I could possibly do. So, yes, Marilyn. Is that a scenario where you can do what they ask, Yeah. Yeah, so that is the other thing, is, is that sometimes, this, there, is, there, there may be a fourth or fifth kind of scenarios, but a third scenario would be, you, you know, everyone's watching. They know the person who's asking you is asking with, like, like, evil intent. They're just taking advantage of you. But you just go along and you whistle while you work and you, you, you go ahead and do it, knowing that your good works then are shining in a really dark light and everyone's looking at you going, why aren't you being upset about this? Why are you giving in to this? Huh. Yeah, right. You know, this is fine. So <laughs> this is fine. But yeah, so again, you have to take into consideration what is the best thing for your neighbor or neighbors in that situation. And sometimes the best thing to do is suck it up and just do your good works and have everyone sit there and go, why is this person so different? All right. Yeah, because that will give you an opportunity to share the gospel. Lastly, Jen asks, can true faith exist without good works? No. The scripture's clear on this. Just as the body that is not breathing is dead, faith without works is dead. You, you know, the person claiming to be a Christian and there are zero good works, yeah, there, there's a term for that. You're a corpse, okay? okay? Just as the body that is not breathing is dead. Every, every funeral we've had here where we've had an open casket, I can tell you, every one of the people in the casket, they never breathed a single breath while during the funeral service, Okay? Scripture describes our good works as the breath that demonstrates that our faith is alive. So just as the body that is not breathing is dead, faith without works is dead. If there are no good works and the only person that person is living for is themselves, that, that person's not a Christian. You know, that, that's a person who needs to repent. So, all right, let's see here. Next question, and this one comes from Stephanie Sangster. How, what does it mean to put on the full armor of God, and how do confessional Lutherans teach spiritual warfare? Glad you asked, and this is always a hot topic. Ephesians chapter 6 is our text, and so here's what Paul says, kind of as a parting shot at the end of the epistle. Finally, be strong in what? 
in the Lord and in the strength of his might. So first and foremost, spiritual warfare is not conducted with your strength or your might. Okay, rule number one. That requires you to ask Christ to give you strength. That requires you to battle with his might, not yours. And so you're going to note here, there's a, there's a big thing that's missing in when it comes to the spiritual warfare being described here. Are you ready what the big thing missing is? Taking territory. Okay? You'll note that there's nothing mentioned here about going and battling the heavenly forces, tearing down strongholds, learning the names of the demons over your particular region, and then decreeing and declaring their powerlessness and nonsense like this. That's all fantasy, okay? So rule number one, you don't get to do this in your own strength. Anybody who does it in their own strength, we have a term for them. They're called casualties, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not wrong, okay? So here we go. Put on the whole armor of God. And by the way, if you're wondering what that is, thankfully we have a list of all of the items. So that you may be able to what? Stand. So here's the idea. Spiritual warfare is done like this. God has raised you to new life in Christ. He's gifted you with the Holy Spirit, washed away your sins, sustains you in the faith through his word and sacrament, and then he sends you out into your different vocations, and your job is to stand. Now, if you think that sounds easy, work with me for a second here. Satan looks at him and goes, or looks at you and goes, hmm, sitting duck. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to light some arrows on fire and fire them at you while you're standing. Okay, so there you are, minding your own business, and all of a sudden, in come the flaming arrows of Satan. What are you supposed to do? No retreating. Your job is to stand. Okay? So what does that look like? Confessing Christ. Telling people the truth. Doing a good job in your vocation. Are you a student? Do your homework and do it well. All right, right? Are you a teacher? Be a good one. Don't be one who sloughs off and thinks, you know, I'm getting paid from the state. Why should I even have to work hard? I've got tenure. I can just kind of kick it and relax, right? Are you an employee? Do a good job even when your boss isn't looking, okay? Anybody can work really hard while their boss is sitting over their shoulder looking over them and going, well, are you working? Oh, yeah, I'm working, okay? When your boss leaves the room, do you then pull up your phone and start scrolling social media? Stop it, okay? So, no, this is what we're talking about here. For... We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We against, against the rulers and against the authorities and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. This is helpful because here's, here, this will tell us who the good team is and the bad team. And if you're sitting there going, the bad team sounds really scary. It is. Okay. That's kind of the point. And your job is to stand against it. That? Yeah. Holy smokes, this is terrible, right? I know, this is why you need Christ's power in the strength. You can't do this in your own. So therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to, what? Withstand in the evil day. Are you saying there's evil days coming? Of course. If you are a Christian, expect them. If you haven't had one in a couple of days, they'll be here tomorrow. No worry, Okay. Okay, so that you may be able to stand in the evil day, having done all to what? Stand. Are you getting the point here? D did you note the repetition? Okay, you're stand, standing, stand, stand, and withstanding, stand, standing. Okay, don't run off the battlefield. I know it's scary, it's awful, and you don't have the ability to do any of these things, but you're supposed to do it in his might. So here we go again. There, Stand, there we go again. Stand, therefore, Having felt fastened on the belt of what? Truth. Huh. Hmm. So do lies factor into the kit of the armor of God? We've got the belt of truth. We have the bat grappler of lies. No, there are, no, lies do not serve the truth. So anything that you're believing that's a lie is going to be extra weight and is going to encumber you and probably hurt you. Okay. 
So the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Whose righteousness is this? Think back to the sermon. This is Christ's righteousness. Okay. And what do breastplates protect? The heart, the guts, the innards. Okay. You get a gut shot, you're dead. And so Christ's righteousness protects you from the satanic gut shot that's going to kill you. As for shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, ah, so I should be ready to run to help anybody with the good news of the forgiveness of sins. And in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming darts of the evil one. And I would note, a little bit of a side note here, historically, um, Roman, Roman legions, when they would get ready to go into battle, okay, their shields always had, they, these were made of steel, but they always had a leather outside to them. And here's what the Roman soldiers would do getting ready to go into battle. They would stop by the, lo- the, the closest river or stream of water, and they would take their shields and they would soak them. Right? Why? Because they know f- flaming arrows are going to be coming in, and so wet shields are really effective against flaming arrows. Wet shields where does one wet their shield? Oh, I know, waters of baptism, right? So you know, the shield of faith and the waters of baptism go together with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, which protects your head. You are saved in Christ. And the sword of the spirit, you have one offensive weapon and it's what? The word of God, okay? Pray, and then here we go. Here's what spiritual warfare looks like, okay? I'm standing with all this stuff on, okay, in comes the flaming arrows of the evil one, and with Christ's strength, extinguish them. This is a terrible situation. Oh, and by the way, the, the, all the evil forces are described in the most terrifying and scary terms, okay? And what do we do in the middle of the battle? Okay, by the way, you ever seen how battles work nowadays, okay? You send in a battalion, and in the battalion, you have all these different troops, and they all have different jobs. There's one guy, and his job is to carry the radio, right? And so they're in the middle of a firefight. Shoo, 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 shoo. Oh, we're locked. We're pinned down. And they call in the coordinates, and they ask for an airstrike, right? Communication. So you're in the middle of a battle. You should then be doing what? Prayer and supplication. Supplications are emergency prayers. Help! We got incoming fire! We don't know what to do. And then you hear back from God, stand. I'm standing, but there's arrows coming in. Stand. Okay, well, pray now. Pray. We need help, God. You got to take out these enemies for us. Do something. Get rid of them, right? So what are you doing? You're constantly communicating through prayers and emergency prayers known as supplications, right? To that end, keep alert at, uh, with all perseverance. Oh, and by the way, how long do you get to do that? A really long time. Okay, but I'm tired. I need some. I I need some R and R. Nope, you don't get a free. You don't get a. You do not get a pass. No, no, no. You got to stay. You got to persevere. How am I supposed to do that with God's strength? Making all supplications. And here's the thing: you're not only praying for yourself because we're all in this battle together. We're praying for each other. And then Paul says, "It also pray for me that the words may be given me to uh, opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak." And we ought to pray that God would give us the ability to preach the gospel with boldness, right? So you'll note here we've now despookified all the spiritual warfare thingy, and this is how it works: you take up these gifts that God has given you, and you stand. And you pray like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> you <know>, help! <laughs> and you do all of this with his strength. And if you're thinking, how are we supposed to do this? That's kind of the point. You can't unless you do this with his strength. Okay? And when one volley is done, don't worry. The, the Satan's regrouping. He's getting ready for the next one. <laughs> and the next one's going to be worse than the one that, that, that just came in. It's just, so that's the idea. You're a Christian. You're a target. Okay? You're not taking territory you're standing. So there you go. I hope that answers the question. Okay, next question. Okay. Um, Pastor, seeking understanding about the following. The rapture, the pre-trib, post-trib, is a rapture, a real event that will happen unexpectedly. If we are left on the earth and not taken, will there be seven years of tribulation? Are there two events, i.e. the rapture, seven years, white throne judgment? The answer is no. Okay, so 
I always like to point this out. Lutherans believe in the rapture, okay? But you have to define it correctly, okay? And thankfully, in the scriptures, when we talk about the eschaton, there is a way of syncing up the events, okay? Let me explain. And I'm going to have to do this quickly because I've got to get down the road here. So this will be our last question. So if I were to go to, let's see, go back to Matthew 24, okay? When we get to the end of Matthew 24, we get to the famous passage that is twisted by the rapturites. Is that a term? Okay. <laughs> okay, so here's what Christ says. So immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Okay. What's missing at this point? All the stars are gone. The sun is darkened. The moon doesn't give its light. Okay? Is anybody on planet Earth calm at this point? (laughs) No. Nobody's calm. Okay? Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. I would note, my guess would be, is that in the space where the stars used to be, a big old cross is going to appear. Okay? And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet. And here's, here's the way you sync all this up. With a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see all of these things, you know, like the sun, the moon, and the stars disappearing, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation, the generation that sees those things, will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So concerning that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, one will be left. What has already occurred before this? The stars have disappeared, the sun is is darkened, the moon isn't giving its light, and the sign of Christ is in the heavens. And then Jesus appears, and then you have people, one will be taken, one will be left. Does this sound like a secret rapture to you? And this is all preceded with a big old blast of a trumpet. Okay? This is the opposite of a secret. Okay? And so if you want to talk about rapture, we'll talk about that. Okay? We will be gathered and join Jesus in the clouds and things like this. Right? That's, that's what this is. So when people talk about a pre-tribulation rapture, They don't understand how to work the symbols of the numbers in the book of Revelation. The seven-year tribulation, we're already in it. We've been in it since Christ ascended. The seven-year tribulation is a symbolic number basically pointing to the time of Christ's ascension until his return in glory. It is not a literal seven years. And so the idea here is is that when Jesus shows up, it's not secret. There's a trumpet. Sun and moon and stars are already gone. And he comes up, and this is now a mop-up operation, and you get the idea, okay? This is a mop, and this is going to bring this whole universe to a cataclysmic end. And let me see if I can find the, uh, the, the cross-reference to this. I'm going to do this from memory, which means I'm probably not going to... Uh, hang on a second, is it five... Uh, here we go. Now, concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have, this is First Thessalonians 5, you have no need to have anyone, anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The what will? The day of the Lord, okay? This isn't talking about a secret rapture. While people are saying, there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in the darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, uh, having put on the breastplate of faith. So you know here that, that what's going on here. So this isn't going to catch us off guard because we know fully what to expect. And what's being described is the actual day of the Lord, the one and only return of Christ. So anyway... 
That's as far as we're going to go today. And uh, Lord willing, we'll see you guys next time. Peace.